Hello, I'm Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor. We're out here in early winter doing filming in the out of doors. Uh, we find that our YouTube presentations have a great deal of popularity and so we feel that people will appreciate if we put a few more uh, fresh uh, episodes on. Today we're going to deal with a situation that uh, uh, is incorporated in our shelter constructions and in emergency applications. The package here, it says thermal emergency blanket. Emergency blanket, well, use it in emergencies. So we got two versions. We got the bigger one that's much more durable and comparatively in the dollar store, you're apt to pay a dollar for one of these and you might pay 10, 20 times that for the much more substantial version. The situation is that these pieces of fabric, you can see the uh, material, they're usually shaped in the, about the same size as a common everyday blanket. And when we say blanket, to my interpretation, this is a, a wool blanket. This is probably an army issue blanket. It looks like the color that, you know, who, who would ever buy a blanket that's that color normally unless it was part of an army, army situation. Now that's a wool blanket, which is substance and thickness, and it has a fabric that captures uh, uh, the, uh, through electrostatic means and other means, it's called insulation. And insulation immediately has thickness associated with it. So if this all weather blanket, the original space blanket, and it says lightweight super insulator, the people that are the ad people that are doing this, they don't seem to know that there's a, a dictionary uh, or they don't know there are physics texts. You've got to have thickness in order to appreciate insulation. And we know how thin the mylar is. This is so, as that's very thin, and yet when you spread it out, you uh, find that it's about the same size as a regular blanket. Now, something like this has a great appeal if you're wanting to create uh, uh, you know, large uh, surface areas when it comes to protection from the wind and the rain and capturing the, the um, effect of the sun and using it to um, augment your ability to stay warm. Well, we'll see when we spread this out, it's a little smaller than the one we have here. And that's the infuriating part about this, that the manufacturer does not seem to think that they have to go beyond the notion that the piece of material they're selling us is the size of a common wool blanket, when it maybe should be two or three. And I would say I'd be happiest if this was five times as big. And I don't mind you charging me twice as much, but give me a piece five times as big instead of these, these uh, small patches that you have to cobble together and, and go to a lot of trouble to try to make an effective uh, uh, shelter. Now here, as we uh, uh, put the two together, you'll notice the brilliance. This is probably two or three times more brilliant than that. So the manufacturer has fallen down in that they've created some kind of a, a, a luminized surface, which uh, to me, it's, uh, you might as well use polyethylene because you're not getting the reflection that you would hope to get. When you can achieve it so readily with this stuff, then why not produce this and have it as brilliant as this? So that right off the bat, that's, uh, we notice that when we incorporate these materials into our, uh, our survival kits and so on, how much different this is to that. So here, this is uh, very compact, very light, and when you read blanket, the human mind interprets that as a blanket, and it isn't. A wool blanket, which we associate from our earliest days, has got thickness. This has no thickness, therefore it can't be insulating on the basis of thickness. But somehow they got the idea that this is uh, used in space age, but they don't realize the difference between reflectivity and, and insulation where this protects you because it's trapped a certain amount of air 
that when the wind blows on this, the density of your fabric and the thickness of your fabric are, are conserving the, the uh, warmed uh, microclimate next to your skin. If you wrap this around a bare skin, you will find a, an astounding amount of glow that you feel. But as time goes on, the moisture that is given off by the skin begins to uh, accumulate between this waterproof, windproof material. And if enough of it collects, then it starts to uh, reverse its property. It now becomes a superconductor <laughs> where it was a reflector. Now it's chilling you. So if uh, paramedics uh, uh, pick you up in the, from the ditch where you've had an accident and you have hurtled out of the car, and thank God for the fact there was three feet of snow and it cushioned your fall and you completely are sitting there melting that snow, soaking wet from that. That's exactly what you want to do to a, a, a casualty. And then they wrap you in the mylar and you don't get any colder or warmer, but that sudden chilling effect you know, in the Vietnam War when the French were were there before they got ousted and eventually the Americans took over the, the war, they uh, began to develop uh, 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 devices that a casualty was immediately put into almost a state of hypothermia because that gave you that much more time to, get, to uh, evacuate them to a hospital where the uh, medical people could uh, do something about your condition. So the ideal thing in winter travel is if you do have an accident, the cushioning action of the snow, but that sudden chilling that's probably going to save your life, but if it goes too far, it's not good either. So to a certain point, and then to stop it from happening. And then they found something like this, that when a newborn baby has a problem with hypothermia, wrap them in, in this shiny stuff. But you can only wrap until the moisture starts to manifest itself. I call that the grace period. So the grace period for, for something like this is probably, uh, I don't know, a couple hours. But beyond that, I think I, if I am right in my, the word might get back to Sweden, but I thought somewhere there was something I read that in Sweden they found that people compromised themselves so much by mistakenly using this, uh, uh, you know, to supplement their sleeping bags and it made conditions worse in the end. So they're saying stuff like that maybe shouldn't be sold to people when they misuse it and find that they compromise their safety because they don't realize that you only have a grace period of a few hours and after that it'll turn around and, and accelerate your chilling and, and, and heating. Now the mylar blanket has its place in the construction of uh, what I call a super shelter, which is a bubble that captures the uh, air. It's sort of like a, a super shelter is the, the, the combination of a greenhouse and an igloo. So you're actually looking at the situation of constructing a a shelter that has both elements to it in a way. There are certain parts of it act like an igloo and certain parts act like a greenhouse. And the reason that there, that is there is that an igloo is built essentially out of snow. But if you're trying to imitate all the features of a good igloo not using snow, you have to get some help from, from what you can learn about greenhouses about the sun shining in through a window, the radiance of an, of an open fire passing through a window and warming up the interior and the window keeps out the smoke and the sparks and the warmth uh, that's generated uh, in that structure now surrounds you completely instead of you just getting the effect of the radiance from the sun or the radiance from the fire. You now have created a, a micro environment that, that will capture uh, warmth and so on. So you find that to use this as a blanket, so referring to this as a blanket, I would say the industry should be told, don't say it's a blanket, say it's a mylar reflective sheet. <laughs> don't say, because blanket implies thickness, implies insulation. And if you use it so that the closer you can get to it without touching it, you're gonna get the full benefit of the reflective action because you glow to the equivalent of a 150 watt light bulb except the light bulb is sort of concentrating its radiance to something smaller than the size of my fist and you are presenting two square yards or two square meters of skin to the environment. But if you're going to add warmth to an enclosure, the light bulb and the, uh, and the uh, uh, human 
produce the same amount of glow. And this will um, uh, reflect that glow to you, thereby you getting a far greater benefit uh, and so on from its use. For example, if I take this and I bring it close to my cheek, I will go slowly towards it and then at a certain point, about there somewhere, I can actually feel, my, my senses will feel there's a glow coming from that direction. Well, that's your glow going there, bouncing back, and you're feeling it. And it's subject to the inverse cube law, that the effect of a glowing object is to one, one over the distance from it cubed, <laughs> and so on. So the closer you can get to it, you're gonna get the maximum benefit of the glow that will reflect. But if you touch it, then pretty soon you'll find condensation of moisture that continually evolves from a living human. Uh, well, condense on it, and that condensation will then uh, create a situation that in the simplistic terms, it'll now act like a, a cold uh, 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 sink, that it'll draw heat from you because of the conductivity of the moisture that's accumulated on there and so on. Now, it's indispensable because it takes the place of the reflective action of snow. So when you build a dome on a snow, called it an igloo or a quincy, you very suddenly uh, uh, detect there's something special about uh, the interior of that structure. And if you had a thermometer sitting in front of you, you would sort of say, hmm, look how low the temperature, and yet I feel so much. I feel something like there seems to be a, a, a warm, uh, some, something that is uh, giving me the sensation of a warming action. If you covered that same dome with black plastic and then you hold the thermometer up in front of you and say, holy mackerel, that, uh, that temperature is pretty high, but boy, do I feel chilled. Why is that? Well, you gotta realize the, uh, the uh, uh, science and the physics involved. This is uh, the opposite of black. White is not the opposite of black, unless you're a painter. The opposite of black, which is the total absorber, is a mirror, which is the total reflector. So you gotta think in those sort of terms that, uh, that when you uh, uh, set yourself up. Now the, um, the, the, uh, the whole issue here that I, that I criticize is that these should be, like this should be maybe, I calculate, Twice as big is still not big enough. I, I, I've uh, recently encountered tube tents that are, uh, that are obtainable in a uh, dollar store, Dollarama, and uh, when you take the tube tent and you cut it, it appears they've, they've taped together two pieces like this because the mylar is manufactured in certain, uh, when you cut it, there you have a decent size. And decent size, well you make a framework that is supposed to be your shelter you might want to sit on a bench that's chair seat high, and so the top of your shelter would, would clear your head a little bit. You would like to put one sheet and cover that whole thing, because basically there's all kinds of indicators that will come in, uh, uh, come in, so people will say, well, what's an ideal size here? Well, that's how you determine it. Will I get a piece of material that one piece will cover it completely from me, for me? instead of using four pieces and the wind is blowing them apart. And because the pieces cannot be sealed, you can't capture the, the micro, create the micro uh, uh, climate. It's just like watching some of these movies recently. And they got these guys that are all wearing furs and they're all flopping all over and it seems like a whole bunch of furs. <laughs> they're not stitched together like an Eskimo suit would be. There's no way you could keep warm. There's no means to capture. The insulative aspect is there, but there's no means to capture any of that warmth. It's sort of like, you know, it's a wonder that we don't kill more actors that are wearing those sort of things than the, the amount of filming they have to do wearing those uh, combinations that look so rustic and look so ancient, but there's no way an ancient person could uh, get by without making something that, that can not flap and, uh, you know, you can't just drape furs over and, and whatever, whatever. So when you're using this, the advantage of using the reflectivity uh, is an important part. But the other thing is the shelter that you produce must not have a, a, a hole the size of your finger will probably completely destroy what you're trying to achieve from the, the warmth that's generated in there jetting out of that hole as if it was a chimney. And then people say, well, there's no big deal. And I'll come up and I'll say, well, what, you don't like what I, I'm telling you? 
well, okay, well, and then I say, well, don't blame me for the fact that you've got holes and you can't seal the edges and so on, that it fails in the conceptualization. That's, that's an important part, and so on. So anyway, I would say that, that this one has the potential of being made into a lean-to structure. The, the reflectivity as uh, attenuated as it is by, uh, by the fact that this isn't brilliant. And why are they choosing this color? Why not black? Because the opposite of shiny would be black. So it's something that's really black on one side and really whatever. I mean, I could use it in the desert. <coughs> I could use it in other conditions. But the people that manufacture, they don't go deep enough into the science because they hated the physics they got taught in high school. And they end up not applying it because they figure there is nothing that you can apply. Just because the bush here is all kinds of like nature, it doesn't mean that you can get away with, uh, with uh, uh, a lot of things. So there is a, like a blanket, it's longer. You sew two of these together and you've started, you now find that, uh, and you could sew four of them together, but you'll find you've got to pay for that extra third one, fourth one. And I cut it diagonally and I stitch the one diagonal on one side and the other diagonal will be this, the back here. And probably be this blanket in some cases for northern use maybe if it was the same silvery on both sides. I don't know what particular advantage there are two there. Uh, but anyway, so two of these sewed edge to edge. One of them cut diagonally and sewed on this edge and then you'll end up getting a lean-to effect. Then you sew a clear polyethylene window on the front because you're very concerned about the, the means to not have a leak. If I can stick a finger in, and that's going to destroy the ability for my shelter to work for me, then any gap bigger than that is just simply going to be, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to get the full advantage that you seek in trying to maximize on the science that you're trying to uh, max, trying to, uh, um, but anyway, uh, when you incorporate this stuff into clothing, the same thing applies. I have run across garments that seem to try to incorporate the high reflectivity. It's kind of hard to produce a fabric that's very shiny and reflective and incorporated because the permeability is so important in clothing. It's awfully hard to really come to terms with regard to producing a fabric that's very shiny on one side and permeable to let the moisture that evolves in the body. And so I would say probably uh, attempts to create such a fabric are exceedingly expensive sort of thing. Uh, but knowing that a human glows to the equivalent of a 150 watt light bulb, uh, that and the fact that a person produces 300 British thermal units. A British thermal unit is heating one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. And if you have a heat source of a, a thousand uh, British thermal units, you'll find you can get something to work with. Uh, in another term of visualizing the situation, you take a box of kitchen matches, usually 250 matches, and if you burn the matches in the box, that's the amount of heat you're adding to the atmosphere on an hourly basis. So, so you've got three boxes like that means if you're sharing a shelter, shelter is built properly, you might discover that the fact that you're carrying a five pound components of a super shelter, you'll sleep in your clothes uh, with uh, a fraction of the effort that it would take you if you uh, uh, were to use other means. If you use the most primitive means with an open lean-to, you take that vehicle and every day the wood that you make a pile as big as the side view of a vehicle with logs that are as long as the vehicle is wide and that's what you're going to have to harvest every day, every 24 hours at 40 below. Smart person would bring sleeping bags, have found out how many sleeping bags it takes to be comfortable at that temperature. Put in one bag and you try it and you say, ah, oh, I'm still cold. Just put a second bag. By the time you put the third bag over 
you'll discover you will be able to crawl into something where you won't have to get up all night. You just crawl in and you're your own furnace and, and uh, the dynamic action of maintaining a fire all night is done away with and you light the fire in the daytime when, when you want to uh, cook and use the fire to, to uh, drive moisture out of your clothing and so on and so on. A lot of these things are very simple and fundamental, but generally a lot of people, they're so far a distance from a lot of that, the science and the physics and all that, that they're so helpless when they come out in the bush. And they don't uh, realize how much benefit you could get by studying the physics and saying, hey, how does this work? How, how, what are we trying to achieve here? And, uh, and then as you begin to play with these things, you discover it works and you discover that here you are using science, sitting there, twiddling your thumbs. The other guy is working like a tornado, like a the Tasmanian devil, and you're relaxing and, and uh, watching them, you know, creating a whirlwind of, of effort because they don't realize that science can work for you too, just as much as, uh, and then when you see these people, they don't pay much attention and they say, and you'll say, okay, tell me what is a warming fire? They have no idea what you're talking about because they haven't been trained to, to the issue of, you know, they don't realize there's cooking fires, warming fires, signal fires, drying fires, incinerating fires. They're all different. They're not all the same thing. The biggest complaint I have about fires is actually is I'll see all kinds of pictures and I say, looks like somebody has got a chainsaw or a saw here because all the wood is cut up like this, but they don't mention anything in the text about who did that. You know, did you arrive somewhere with a pile of all those short sticks like that cut for you? Did you cut them? And if you cut them, did you not uh, expose yourself to the hazard of felling a tree, maybe, and killing yourself because you didn't know what you're doing when the tree was coming down and stuff? But anyway, this here is, I would say, extremely valuable if you know how to use it. A hazard if you misuse it. And uh, uh, it puts us into the space age because the people that manufacture this figure that you are really impressed that you're using a space age product to go camping. <laughs> well, human nature being what it is, I guess the the people that uh, the the spinner, the people that spin the hype and everything, they they've got to say things that'll convince you. If you're sort of wishy-washy about it, they got to say enough. They say, "Well, I'm convinced. I guess I'm going to buy myself a few of these and use them," and then you discover that uh, there are better things. They're, and and the, 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 the way they, it's one thing that they produce something for you, it's another thing that you learn how to apply it where you get the maximum benefit out of it. Now there are a lot of little things that come in with this stuff. Very fragile, the slightest nick. So if you stretch this up, being as light, I mean there's a lot of merit to it. It, uh, it breaks the wind sheds the rain and it reflects uh, uh, heat. But if it's set up like a lean-to tarp, it's common for them to, to flap in the wind in a very short while, they're all shredded. And the lightest nick, they don't, they don't do something to the edge to prevent the nicks, because the lightest nick is going to give you a, uh, the wind is going to rip it, sort of thing. Uh, if you submerse this, and you don't realize that the water has gotten into the folded blanket, a year or so down the line you unfurl it, there is no shiny. It's all <coughs> corroded or the moisture has destroyed that shiny and so you don't have the benefit of this shiny uh, material. Now the manufacturers could also provide us with this mylar, which is very tough material, provided it doesn't have that Achilles tendon of the nick on the edge. And uh, in clear and in shiny, and then that way you could combine the two and have a pretty durable sort of thing. But you should be doing something about the edges so that they don't, uh, so that they don't tear. It's just, it's, it's just the tear is the lightest tear, unbelievable. And yet I can gather up the blanket, have a person lay in it, and uh, you know you can lift a person and carry them in this mylar as long as you don't nick the edge. It's that tough in the middle sort of thing. Generally, too, with the mylar, you, you often are confounded with how to tie it down because the wind will flutter and, you know, you have to get used to the sound that it makes. And one thing we used to do is put a patch of tape on the mylar 
and then put a safety pin through that and then use string to, for guy lines. So you'd put it. Uh, and the other thing is to use a clothesline like device to clamp it down to keep it in place when you incorporate it into a structure. Uh, generally the super shelter has got mylar that faces you and it's got polyethylene for the window and uh, you know the most of the other protection and uh, a part of it is parachute fabric to contribute uh, uh, a vapor permeable part of the shelter so that you get refresh the air inside of a hermetic uh, a sealed enclosure and so on. Now when you talk about blankets, this is a, a wool blanket. There are many different types of weaves. This wool, I would say, when I was a kid, periodically my parents would gather up every woolen item that had accumulated on the farmstead in the form of worn out clothing and so on, and they'd send it away. There was some kind of an agency that would take all that and pound for pound, so you, they sent you black blankets. And I assumed that they took the wool and reprocessed it, and the blankets were looked like felt. You'll get, get blankets that obviously are woven with a special weave, but of course when you take whatever underwear and all kinds of things made out of wool, and you're going to re, redo that, you chop it all up and, and, red, and then spin it into a more like of a felt-like and I remember that happening because I marveled at that. We sent all that all old stuff away and I would come back, blankets. So whoever was doing it was probably sending you back the equivalent of half what you sent them. Or they made a profit somehow. But that, there was an agency, Winnipeg or someplace, where all the people around us did that. Because we had that address. People said, ah, you know, all this stuff that, that's uh, old socks and old blankets and, and old uh, sweaters and all that stuff. Get, send them to that place and they'll send you back you know nicely woven blankets but there are certain blankets that are made of the original virgin wool you might say and they're different in that if you take a wire brush and you really brush them you'll create quite a fuzzy nap which is very important because I, early in my career I had a student show up on one of our, on our one of our courses where we did a lot of canoeing and he wore a blanket and when you encounter people like that initially depending on your uh, mental attitude you'll say you know what's you know this guy's going to compromise himself and he's going to compromise us because he's going to and you end up finding you watch them carefully and you say they are doing much better with that blanket with a nap that has been brushed up staying warm and dry than the people wearing conventional rain gear which captures the moisture and so on he had learned that uh, uh, conventional rain gear was not the answer in, the, in that sort of sense. And uh, one day I had a booth next to Parks Canada booth and they were the Parks Canada component of the uh, various forts uh, and so on and they had blankets sitting on their table and what these were were reproductions of the real Hudson Bay blankets. And it cost $600 a blanket to make them the way they were made originally when the Hudson Bay Company traded those blankets. And they were maybe three centimeters thick. Well, now I realized, oh, the trapper said, well, I took three blankets and I went on the trap line, even in spite of the fact it was 45 below, I was able to sleep out there. Well, that's a different blanket from the ones that we have here. You know, think insulation. To sleep at 40 below, you need to have this much thickness around you. <laughs> because there's no other magic that an insulation, you find insulation, it's uh, directly related to thickness. It's simple and easy to visualize and understand. And, and uh, the way that keeps you warm is a lot different than this keeps you warm. Now, I don't know if I've missed anything, but uh, the, uh, the situation is that to me, used properly, this is extremely valuable. Taking the information off the package and uh, trying to understand what the manufacturer is trying to tell you, no good, not good. <laughs> you're, you're most certainly not maximizing. None of these manufacturers come to people like uh, physicists and scientists and say, hey, you know, 
uh, but let's uh, bone up on this. Maybe we can sell more blankets if we have a kind of a piece, folded piece of paper that says this is what reflectivity is. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I never see that. I never see anybody saying that you glow to the equivalent of a 150 watt light bulb. A lot of people say, well, I don't believe you. And I say, I don't give a hoot if you don't believe me. It's not going to be me that suffers because they're so stunned that they really don't want to believe what you're trying to say. They don't believe that it's possible for you to say that the human body glows to the equivalent of a 150 watt light bulb. But today we got cameras and infrared detectors and everything and you pointed at people. My son has got this uh, app on his uh, cell phone. It's really funny to see a cat <laughs> when you so put this on because the anus glows so brilliantly <laughs> it's almost blinding. <laughs> so you see a cat wandering around. So his nose glows, maybe his ears glow a little bit, but when he turns around and his ass in, points in your direction, there's a very brilliant, br brilliant spot glowing at you. 